Well, good morning, North Phoenix. Morning. I can't see you, so I just have to take by faith that you're, that you're here. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Make a brother feel better. Thank you. For, it's always a privilege to, uh, to be able to come and uh, share God's word with you. And uh, another big privilege is just being able to give our pastor a little break uh, so he can get rested up. And so I'm thankful to be able to do that. And uh, it's been great going through this this series uh, in Hebrews, a uh, powerful series about the centrality and the superiority of Christ and the sufficiency of his position as high priest and also the acceptable sacrifice on our behalf. And uh, so I have the, I've been tasked with uh, addressing and unpacking um, Hebrews chapter 8, looking at the new, the new covenant, and uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But I have to, I have to say this, um, I've had the uh, privilege of uh, studying and teaching and so forth and then engaging, interacting with uh, these covenants that, uh, that I'll be sharing and talking about um, this morning. But I don't know whether it's the stage in life, uh, age, or, or what it is. Um, in the last service, I was thankful that there was a baptism between the time I got up and walked up because that song that was sung just before the baptism had me just, as we used to say, sniffing and snotting, you know, just, <laughs> and uh, I come from a uh, church background where I used to watch older people just at a certain point just get up and just flail, and I'm thinking, I think I get it now, um, <laughs> because I'm listening to that song, you know, God's been, been so good, and if I don't stop talking about it, I'll be in trouble again, but uh, one of the things that's, that's happened when in engaging these uh, covenants in prepping for this morning was a question of why. A question of why. why. Why on earth would an eternal, sovereign, all-knowing, omniscient God, first of all, create humankind, but then the other one is why does he chase after us so relentlessly with all the craziness that we do? He knows how we are. He knew that before he created us. And so as I read through these, these, these covenants in the Old Testament and I, and I look at the people, I identify with the, the namesakes of the covenants and, and the people that they represent, and I see myself. And so really a lot of what I've been doing over the last week is asking, why does God chase me down so much? When I realize that I am those folks. And the other thing that's crazy about it is God is the one who initiates the covenants. He's the one that goes and meets with and provides these covenant promises. It's his initiative. And he does it to people who, on a lot of occasions, just say thanks, but no thanks. I don't need you. And so I sit there and go, how on earth? And it just has to be, I come to the conclusion that he has a love for you and for me that we just can't wrap our minds around. He knows us inside and out. He knows our thoughts. Everybody's sitting here looking all pretty and nice here in church, but he knows us behind the scenes. He knows me. How do, how do I stand up here behind this podium? And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. If anything, I invite you into a place of contemplation with this, nothing too deep, but just considering this love that God has for us as we talk about these covenants. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and and flip to uh, Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm just going to read uh, Pastor Noah and Brother da uh, Dawson last week did a, a great job in, uh, in talking about the high priest's office of, of Jesus, and, uh, and it bleeds over into chapter 8, but I'm going to pick us up at, chap at verse 6, if you would, in Hebrews uh, chapter 8. And it reads like this, uh, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For 
if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them uh, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. And then verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward them, their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. And in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what has become an obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity once again of being able to open your word and, uh, and hear from you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would just connect our hearts and our minds, our souls to what you have us to understand with reference to your amazing love as demonstrated through these covenants and through your son, Jesus. And uh, we'll be thankful as always to give you the honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name, amen. One could almost say when you look at the tapestry that has been woven together in the stories that come with the, the covenants that God makes. You, it, one can almost say uh, that God is, loves us very curiously and he pursues us very recklessly. That God's love appears careless and his chasing and his coming after us is so reckless. Well, Emory, why do you say that? Well, I say that about myself and about us because we are some messed up people. And when we look at the folks that God deals with in the Old Testament through these covenants, they're messed up and broken and self-absorbed and evil, prideful. And there's some that are just outright stupid. I know we don't have any of those here, but in their day, they had some, they had some stupid people. And yet, God chased them down. And God loved on them. And so I just want to take a survey, and I, I just want us to, to put ourselves into these, to take out a big theological thing with Flugies, and just look at ordinary people like ourselves. Uh, I, I just saw a movie here recently where the two lead actors are kind of doing a historical movie on something, and the two lead actors were so good, I was so mad at them. Uh, and it was about five of us in the theater, and I just kept yelling at the screen. You guys are knuckleheads. I can't believe you, blah, 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 and stuff not f suited for church. And so, that'll land in a minute. And I believe that sometimes when we look at God and how he dealt with the folks through these covenants throughout the Old Testament, it makes us wonder why. We'll start with the one in, in Eden, the Edenic uh, covenant. I call it the covenant of identity and purpose. This is in Genesis chapter one and two. And this is where it says that God created man and woman, Adam and Eve, in his image. They're image bearers. They're co-rulers co of, the, uh, of, the, of the earth that God's given them. They're loving partners. They have this beautiful wedding. They have purpose, unity, and they have choice. God gives them choice. And you know what they do with that choice? They choose to be disobedient and to be independent. They're sitting in a garden with everything that they need, and they have this opportunity to walk with God through the garden every day of their lives. And they choose to be disobedient and to be independent of God. 
despite what he has given them and where he has placed them. It's what I call wide-eyed disobedience. Nothing fuzzy about it. They just, God says do it this way, I'm going to do it this way. Any wide-eyed disobedient people in the house? I know you're not going to raise your hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Here's one up here. They just up and disobeyed him. But God in his grace and his, in, in his mercy, he made a provision for him. Slew an animal, put covering on him, and it declares that one day I'm going to reorder things here and I'm going to make up for this. He, he, he gives them hope, even though they've disobeyed him. And then there's a, the uh, Noahic covenant. Things have gotten so bad on earth. You know, Adam and Eve had two boys. Uh, the oldest ones killed, uh, murdered the youngest one. And just things went from bad to ugly. And God said, you know what? I I'm through with this. I'm going to flood the earth and get rid of everybody. And you can hear that cosmic audience going, yes! Ugh. Get them, God. But then there's this one family, Noah, that was righteous. And God said, okay, Noah, you and your, your family, get on this boat and take some animals with you, but the rest of them I'm going to wipe out. And so he does. And so Noah and his family spend almost a year on this boat as God floods the earth, and they wait on it to dry. But finally it dries. They come off the boat. And God makes a covenant with them. I will never flood the earth again. And just so you remember that, I'm going to give you this rainbow across the sky. Maybe some of you might have seen one during this rain period that we just had. It's a reminder of this covenant. It's a sign off on this covenant that I won't flood the earth again. And you know how what happens when good things happen? You want to celebrate, right? So Noah decides he wants to celebrate. And the brother goes and gets drunk and ends up exposing himself. Well, that was okay for Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2, but it was not okay for Noah. And his youngest son walks in and, and, and finds him naked, laying there, drunk as a skunk. And he goes and tells his brothers, brothers come in, back in, put the cover over him. But as a result of that, Noah announces a curse, not on his son, but on his grandson, Canaan. And the rest of the story is chaos ensues because of this family and Noah's drunkenness. But God loved this guy and honored this guy and named, and we had named a covenant after him. Has anybody uh, in the house done anything stupid? Why, no, Noah, why? Look at what, you're the only one left on the planet, you and your family. But we do stupid stuff, don't we? I know I do. And God is just careless in his love for me and reckless and still chasing me down and chasing you down. Then there's Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. God calls Abraham and his family out from among their folks and he makes this covenant within a covenant of national and global blessing. Noah's covenant was a, was a covenant of renewal and hope. Abraham's is a covenant of national and global blessing, Genesis 12, 15, and 17. God chooses Abraham. He's going to give him this land flowing with milk and honey, this sacred lineage. Through his descendants, they're going to fill the earth, and the rest of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. To his seed, God is going to bless him. But you know what Abraham did, like some of us do? He thought he would help God out. So he had a little bit of lapse of faith. And so he decides, since Sarah is so old and beyond childbearing, that he's going to hook up with Hagar, Sarah's handmaid. And so they get together and they have Ishmael. And some of the crazy things that we see happen in the Middle East comes out of this decision that Abraham made to help God out. How many of us in our life 
God has done so much for us, but we have one moment and one space of time where there's this lapse of faith and we take things into our own hands. And what does that get us? And what did it get Abraham and his family? But God, again, again, God restores him because he demonstrates his faith and his sacrifice, his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac. And Abraham becomes the father of the nation. Who does that? The brother committed adultery in a sense. And someone said, oh, no, that was his wife. But that's God's careless love. And then there's the Mosaic covenant, the old covenant that is referred to in, in, in our chapter, in our passage in Hebrews. It's the covenant of distinction and exclusivity. This is where God grabs Moses, a murderer, killed somebody, but he calls him to a burning bush and he says, I've heard the cries of my people in Egypt and Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down and deliver them. And I got your back and we're going to do some, some amazing signs and wonders and stuff and, 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 and we're going to deliver the people from Egypt. And sure enough, Moses goes down, works the miracles, the great powers, powerful signs. The nation leaves Egypt. They're being pursued by the, by, by the Egyptian army, but they get to the Red Sea, can't go across. God opens up the Red Sea. They go through. The Egyptian army is drowned, and now they're on their way to the land flowing with milk and honey. And they find themselves at the foot of, of Mount Sinai, and God makes a covenant with them through the Ten Commandments when Moses comes down, and he gives them this set of laws that, that they are to abide by, and as long as they abide by them uh, 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 religiously, morally, legally, God says, I'll bless you, but when you mess up, I'm going to curse you. It was a conditional covenant that he gave to them. But the people became rebellious. They were out in the wilderness go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Moses, what you bring us out here for in this dirty desert? We want to go back Where? They want to go back to Egypt. Are you kidding me? I call this belligerent ungratefulness. Anybody been there? God has blessed you. God has given you this. And you turn around and in essence flip God off. We want to go back. And God says, I'm not taking you back, but you're not going into the promised land. So that generation wandered for 40 years. The children went in, but not them. But God's going to continue to bless. He eventually gives them the land. Careless love. Reckless pursuit for folks like us. And then there's David. David. David, the, the, the headline said, shepherd boy becomes king. And God calls him out and God makes a covenant with this, with this shepherd, with this king, that he's going to have a royal lineage, uh, uh, a throne and lineage that will eventually bring the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that his throne will last forever. He makes this great covenant with David. And David is like, yes. But David's problem is David lacks self-control. And he looks out with some free time on his hand and he commits adultery. But not only does he commit adultery, but he commits what? He commits murder because he has the husband of the woman that he committed adultery with set up to where he's killed in battle. He's an adulterous He's a murderer, but in Acts chapter 13, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. Now, somebody help me out. David was faithful. If you read the Psalms, David was faithful. David confessed his sin. God forgave him, and God blessed him. And he did what he needed to do in his generation. 
Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, people like us, that God just loves and comes after recklessly. And then we come to the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. God has sent the people into captivity. The kingdoms were divided. God sends them into captivity. Judah, the southern kingdom, is now in Babylon under slavery. God has just told them in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, you're going to be here for a minute. Somebody said you're going to be out in two years. No, you're going to be here for a while. Grow where you're planted. And then two chapters later, even with this nation in captivity and being punished, God still has a vision for the nation. In chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, essentially the same covenant wording that I read to you earlier in Hebrews. It is God declaring that these folks will have his law in their hearts and in their minds, and that they will be his people, and that they will know him, and that he will show mercy on them and do not remember their sins. And so we transition into the New Testament, and there's a verse in John chapter 1, verse 14, where 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is only begotten from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. God decides what I'm going to do is I'm going to step into this humanity in the person of my son, Jesus. And I'm going to come down, as Pastor has shared in, 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 in chapter 2 and in chapter 4, Jesus steps into our humanity so that he can feel and know where we're coming from. And he's going to demonstrate in his time on the planet what it means to be loved by God. And they're going to flock to him because of his love and his compassion. And then he's going to sit down at, towards the end of his time on, 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 on earth just before he is crucified, and he's going to enact and initiate a new covenant. He sits down. My notes are getting scrambled here. Sorry. He sits down with his disciples, and it says, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And so he inaugurates this new covenant that Jeremiah had talked about earlier. And now Jesus is going to bring it into reality. Why? Because he's going to move into position as the great high priest, number one. But then he's going to be the acceptable sacrifice before God. And this high priest is the final high priest. It says in the first part of uh, Hebrews chapter 8 that he is now the high priest that sits at the right hand of God the Father. Having made the acceptable sacrifice, sacrifice that it is his blood that is sprinkled on the altar that is in heaven and God receives that aroma of his sacrifice and sins are now forgiven and cleansed and because of that position because of that office and because of that offering God says what he says here in verses 10 through 12 that now he's going to enact this new covenant, and listen, listen, North Phoenix, it becomes ours. 
what he had promised in Jeremiah 31 is now activated in us. Watch this. Watch this. The first thing that he says, again, verse 10, I will put my laws into their hearts, into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This first thing here, if you're taking notes, is to write down, God speaks into my soul. God speaks into my soul. Listen to what he says in John chapter 16. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but I cannot, uh, you cannot bear them now. What the spirit of truth, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that, I, all that the Father has is mine, and therefore I have said he will take it, take what is mine and declare it to you. When you and I place our faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the Spirit of the living God comes to live within us. This becomes his dwelling place. And so just as the prophets prophesied in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel and other places, the God says, I'm going to place a new spirit in them. And you and I this morning who have placed our faith in Christ are the beneficiaries of this covenant because the Spirit of God lives in us. And as we encounter the Word of God, the Spirit brings to life in us what God has to say and what God wants us to do. It's no longer external, but it's all about what goes on inside of us. The question on the table is how much time do we spend inside? Spend in God's word. Scriptures say because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we are God's peeps. We are his people. We belong to him. We are a royal priesthood to God. The second part of this covenant, new covenant says, for all will know me from the least to the greatest. First one is God speaks into my soul. The second point is I connect with God's heart. Isn't it, isn't it easy to trust somebody if you know their heart? If you know where someone's coming from, if, you, if, 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 if their heart is good, if you've had interaction with them, you can trust them. You can trust them. For they will know me. And God, God gives us the opportunity to know him. In John chapter, uh, chapter 14, verses 7 through 10a, it says this. If you had known me, you would have uh, known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us a father and it is enough. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father? And what? And the Father is in me? Listen to what he says in uh, chapter 14, verse 15 and 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the, uh, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, the Spirit. For what? He dwells with you. And when I go and when he comes, he's going to do what? Be in you. And you and I are able to enjoy the benefits of this new covenant because the Spirit of God lives in us. And he is the one that helps us to know God that God is not a stranger to us because Jesus himself, the Son of God, lives in us. And Jesus says, I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. And if you've placed your faith in Jesus as your personal Savior, they live in you. And you are the people of God. But then he closes out. God speaks into our soul. I connect with the heart of God. 
But the third one, he says, for I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. The third point here is Jesus pays all my debts. My debts are finished. Again, in, in uh, Colossians chapter 2, let me read that to you. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, it says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our tres trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. God has forgiven us. God has nailed it to the cross. When he says here, I will remember their sins no more, it doesn't mean that God has a divine amnesia. It doesn't mean that. It simply means that he doesn't hold our sins against us. It's almost like he doesn't care, which has me thinking he's careless. And as I close, I just want to remind you, I think a picture of this is the prodigal son who demands his inheritance and his father gives it to him. And he leaves and goes off, spends it all, wastes it all. And he finds himself in a hog trough and he sits down and he's trying to make up this way. I got to go back to my father. I want to come up with something where he'll receive me again. And so he goes in, he has this all prepared and his father sees him coming and he runs, he grabs him, he gives him a big old bear hug. He says, my son is home. He said, yeah, but dad, I don't care about that. You're home. You're home. God loves us carelessly and pursues us recklessly. We have entered into this new covenant because of the high position of Jesus as the high priest and because he made the acceptable sacrifice. So I wonder this morning if there are some here who have never come to a place where you have invited Jesus to the inside of your life by placing your faith in him and understanding that when he died on the cross, he took everything that you've ever done and he paid for it, everything that you will ever do. There's nothing outside his fingertips. He's paid it all. And perhaps this morning that you feel something that's saying, you know what, I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. And I ask that you would come when it's over and talk to someone up front. But for the vast majority of you, you can see yourself like I saw myself in the lives of Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David in some capacity. And maybe God is saying, I'm, I don't care how much you run, you keep looking over your shoulder, I'm there. I love you carelessly. I've pursued you recklessly. Will you come home so I can give you a big old bear hug? And maybe that's your decision that you need to make this morning as we come to a close. You do that between you and God. On the one hand, Jesus, I need you. I thank you that you died for me. You rose again. I need forgiveness. I want a relationship with you. On the other hand, Lord, I know I've been running. You've been chasing me. <sighs> I'm tired. Here I am. Give me a big hug. Let's pray together. Father, you're, you're just, you're just, you're just, you're just too amazing. It's beyond that you would put up with the likes of us. But you do indeed love us carelessly and pursue us recklessly. Just keep coming and coming and coming. Just like you kept making these covenants over and over and over. So I thank you that you're here this, this morning in the person of your spirit. And he is moving throughout this auditorium. And I pray that there be those who will respond and give their lives to you. To understand that it's an inside relationship that you want. That we are your people 
we can know you and understand that we've been forgiven, Lord. Everything's been forgiven. We can come and get our bear hug. Thank you that you're moving in my life, in the lives of my brothers and sisters here this morning. We love you. We adore you. Thank you for loving us carelessly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Thank you all. We'll see you here next week. We have the uh, Fort Phoenix event this afternoon, and where we, you see all these bags up here, and come and be a part of that this afternoon at 2. God bless you. If you need to talk to anyone, there'll be some folks up front.